Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Al Rochelle, as always, joined today by St. Petersburg Times political editor Adam Smith, who will introduce our guest today. Adam, good to see you. Thanks, Al. Uh, St. Petersburg City Council Member Carl Nurse is here. Thanks for being here. That's a pleasure. Uh, give us a sense. What is the biggest problem, the biggest issue facing St. Petersburg today? Uh, the biggest issue is that the city is about 10% short on revenue. And of course, we're a part of a national recession, which plays into that. So that means we're looking probably 15, 20 million dollars in cuts to the operating budget. If I'm Joe Sixpack, St. Petersburg residents, how am I going to feel that? Well, I think you'll see it. You know, take a little, little, little longer to answer the phone. The grass will be longer at the, at the playgrounds. Some fees will be a little bit longer. But mostly, we're trying to do internal cuts. That means that travel budgets get wiped out, trainings get wiped out, marketing gets reduced. We're trying to do those kinds of things so that, so that you won't notice it whether you're you know, the water or the garbage or the sewer or the police or the fire. Carl, the city does have a rainy day fund. When can you use that fund and is now a good time to think about using it? I did convince the rest of council last week to tap into that and I'm hopeful that, that we can use about a quarter of the rainy day fund to soften the impact. And if we can do that, I don't think you, people should see noticeable impacts. And how much is in the rainy day fund? Uh, $21 million. So you're looking about using about five? Yes. Okay. I want to ask you, uh, the legislature passed a bill that bars local governments from using tax dollars to uh, you know, basically campaign, things like the penny for Pinellas. The city is taking a stance against that, asking Charlie Chris to veto it. Why? Well, our, our city attorneys say that that would prohibit uh, the city council and, and uh, from arguing in public for or against items because we are paid. Uh, we, don't have any, we don't have any issue with spending dollars, but we do have an issue with the ability to, to speak up. Isn't that kind of an extreme interpretation that you, know you would lose your First Amendment right to speak? Uh, I think it's extreme, but that's what, the, that's what our lawyers are telling us. You've got an election coming up, and we have five seats that are vacant. We also have uh, nine or ten, depending upon what day you talk about, m uh, people that are running for mayor. Is there a drain of experience, particularly on city council, because you ha you're going to have so many newcomers, and you actually have a lot of newcomers on it now? Uh, yes. And after this election, there'll be nobody on city council with more than one term of experience and a brand new mayor. And I think collectively, that I hope the voters will think about that when they think about who they, sh who they should elect. And who are you liking in, in this big, vast field for mayor? I am uh, cowardly, uh, <laughs> you know, gonna, I have a primary, I'm, I'm going to work my primary, and my assumption is that after the primary, there'll be two people left that are different enough that I'll endorse one of the two. Well, we're, we're looking at, uh, I think a lot of people don't quite realize this, but absentee ballots, tens of thousands of absentee ballots are going to be mailed in mid-July. And this election really could be over well before before September 1st primary. Do you Are you worried people aren't quite engaged and, and paying attention enough? Oh, I'm quite sure that people don't know enough yet who to vote for. You know, it's not, it's not a requirement that when you get your ballot in mid-July that you vote in mid-July. I'd suggest people put it on their kitchen table or, and, and wait, wait a month while they, while they see. I was able to get uh, televised debates through council, and so we will have televised debates in early August. I would suggest that people try to watch those. When you have that many candidates, though, and we saw that in the, uh, the Democratic primaries, it's almost difficult to tell where people stand unless they have radically different ideas. That's a serious problem when you have a dozen candidates or close to it. I agree. Let me ask you, you have in the past been fairly critical of Mayor Rick Baker. I, I haven't heard it as much lately. W has your thinking about him evolved? Give me an assessment of his performance. Well, two things happened. One, it looked better. I confess it looked better on the inside. Uh, and the other was that I realized that I was going to be on council with him for 18 months. There were more places where we agreed or where he didn't care than there were we dis where we disagreed. So I've been working on those areas. He's very good on energy issues. We've been working very aggressively on that. Uh, we, we work together a lot on midtown issues, mostly e economic issues. And so that keeps me plenty busy. You've told us earlier before this conversation began that what really turns you on or what you really enjoy working with are those economic issues. How do you get areas like Bethel Heights, which is an area that, that was built a number of years ago that needs to be rehabbed? A, a, a lot of crime takes place there right now. Where do you get the money to turn that around? And how do you get, ha, let that bleed off to other areas of the city that could also improve? Well, typically it, it starts with, with getting uh, the folks from the housing department and the recreational department and the police department in there and we begin to identify what are the problems and usually there are four or five inexpensive things that we can do quickly and mm -hmm. that's where we start. 
we just chip away at it there, and and then we begin looking for for grant money, and and we, uh, we believe we can get some money from HUD to help turn that project around. But first, we have to do the easy things. And talk about your idea you mentioned about the Bank of St. Petersburg, Bank for uh, St. Petersburg. Well, Bank on St. Pete is modeled on a San Francisco model. The theory essentially is that about 15,000 people in town do not use our traditional check cashing or check checking account services. So they get stuck into a predatory lending process, which is uh, uh, check cashing services, payday loans, check and cash advances, and, uh, tax uh, refund anticipation loans. It takes between 5 and 7% of their income for what you and I get for 100 bucks a year. And so we've lined up 15 banks and about 40 uh, fin uh, financial literacy groups, and we're going to kick off this in, in the 1st of August. And we think within two years we can get half of the people who do not have checking accounts into the main line system. So you're yeah. talking about one of the leading mayoral candidates, Devron Gibbons, is the vice president of Amscot Financial. Isn't that a direct shot at him and his business? It wasn't aimed that way, it, <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is taking things from a whole different perspective, I certainly agree. We have to talk about the police chief because there's been a lot of controversy about whether Chuck Harmon is doing a good job or not. Do you support him right now? And if a new mayor, whoever was elected, wanted him removed, would you support that? I think the, 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 the mayor should communicate what he expects of the people that run his departments and, and, and give them a chance to do that. One of the things that Harmon is really bad at is communicating that, that we're coming after him. I mean, in, in this environment, what he ought to be saying is, look, we have 10 percent more police than we had a year ago. We, we, you know, we've added three or four units specifically targeted at, at drug dealers and, and gangs. Uh, we're beefing up our anti-crime efforts mm -hmm. and our crime watch efforts. He often doesn't say that. I want to I squeeze one uh, question before we run out of town. You were appointed to represent a district that was really originally carved out for African-American representation. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you square that? Do you think the district is ready to embrace a, a white guy representing a, a basically a black district? Uh, that's been my experience. Uh, I try to work on issues that are not race driven, and I mean I represent an area that the average income is twenty seven thousand dollars, and so that's that's why I work on economic issues. And and when I do that, color seems to disappear. I should also say that St. Pete is integrating, and so. There's another district that is just slightly whiter than black, and two of the three candidates in that race are, are African-American. And so I think things will work out. Yeah. All right, Carl Lurs, thank you so much for joining us. Just reminding our viewers, September 1st is the primary. Uh, a lot of folks are going to be running for office. You're going to need to say uh, up on what's going on with them. Carl, thank you so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. Thank you.